Hello, I am glad to formally welcome you all to the special lecture session organized by Talotama Foundation. I am Kamakshi Vasan, Vice President Talotama Foundation. Talotama Foundation is a global think tank working in the areas of international relations, area studies, financial, environmental, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. We are glad to have among us Ms. Fatima Gilani, member, negotiating team of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and an Afghan women's rights activist. Today's special lecture is by Ms. Fatima Gilani and it is titled as Afghan Peace Negotiations, Taliban and the Challenges for Women. I thank Ms. Gilani for being here with us and talking about this very important issue. I think all of us would like to see a prosperous, peaceful and free Afghanistan. Ms. Gilani and other Afghan female leaders like her are doing so much for this cause. They are an inspiration for so many people around the world. We have had the pleasure of hosting Ms. Fawzia Kufi and Dr. Habiba Sarabi on previous occasions this year. And I'm very pleased to have Ms. Gilani speaking for, to us today. Ms. Gilani joins us from Doha in Qatar where the negotiations have been going on. Let me now request Ms. Galani to deliver the special lecture. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you very much, uh, Kamakshi um, and the Telmata um, Foundation. Um, it is um, a very important time for us, and it is a very timely to talk about uh, these issues. And it is important in the region that they should understand what is exactly going on in Afghanistan. In my opinion, and the opinion of many people that they have the experience of the past, they will see that never in the history of Afghanistan, peace talk and political settlement and political negotiation has been so important. I think it is much more than important, it is vital. It is life and death of Afghanistan. It is true that we see a huge um, success, a military success of Taliban in the fields in Afghanistan. But does it really mean that it will bring peace for Afghanistan? Absolutely not. We have seen it before. We have to know that military success, not necessarily ends into peace and prosperity of a country. On the contrary, it is the continuation of war and it will be resistance from all parts. That's why I'm saying today again that peace talks and the political settlement has never been this important for Afghan nation. The 43-year-old war of Afghanistan has taken hostage life, happiness, prosperity, even health of Afghan people. It made Afghanistan refugees, millions of Afghan refugees in neighboring countries and beyond. But what is really peace for the people of Afghanistan? And especially what is peace for women in Afghanistan? <clears throat> Hundred years, a history of changes for women brought lots of lots of up and downs for Afghan women. Yes, it was exactly 100 years ago, 1921, when girls were sent outside Afghanistan for further education to come back and education the rest of women. It was a bold, but an important step from King Amanullah and his wife, Queen Soraya, to send women outside Afghanistan to bring changes back. This hundred years brought lots of ups and downs. Yes, these women went inside, uh, went and came back to Afghanistan. 57 years ago, I was a child. I saw women getting into high position as ministers and also getting the most important right that a woman can have, a human being can have, is the right to vote and the right to be elected. 
in Afghanistan, men and women together, they got that right. And I'm proud to say many, many years before a Swiss woman or many women in the world could have this right. Is it possible today to believe that women in Afghanistan were, I mean, steps and steps forward and the Swiss women were behind them? Is it believable? It is not. Why isn't it not? Because of war, because of changes, because of the way the women in Afghanistan were hurt, the way a child was hurt in Afghanistan, the way the people of Afghanistan were hurt because of war. As I said, I was a child when I saw women in the ministerial post. I saw in an open and equal competition, women win seats in the parliament, in the upper house and lower house. I remember their names. I remember their faces. Although we didn't have television to see them like today, every day the faces in front of us. But I remember seeing those pictures in black and white pictures in the newspapers. Yes, I was born and brought up in the time of peace. I remember what peace was. I was expecting mother that I still lived in peace. I was a young mother when the war started. When I compare what war brought to Afghanistan to the time that I lived and I grew up, tears brings, tear comes to my eyes. And I want to show to the young people of Afghanistan that what peace was, but I'm short of words because it's impossible for them to understand when they were born and brought up, became mothers and fathers in war. War took everything from us. We were made refugees. Our country was destroyed. We became wanderers all over the world. And the worst part of it, the worst part of it for me is that we became dependent on others. This is terrible. I hope that no one in the world will get to that point, that in a potentially rich country like Afghanistan, you become poor and you become dependent on others. Everyone saw, everyone was hurt, men and women, children, young, old, but when, when women is hurt, when a woman is vulnerable, it is impossible to understand for those people that they live in peace and prosperity. Women were number one victims in Afghanistan, whether it was war, whether it was men leaving their homes to go and fight either on one side or the other side, women were hurt. When a woman were left alone to look after their children and feed their children without any support, this woman is very vulnerable. But when it comes to the point, and this didn't start it during the Taliban only, it started long before that. When a woman was not able to take her own destiny in her hand in education, in political participation, in everything is life. This is the time that everyone has to look at it. Everyone one has to remember that this should not repeat again. I remember women in the refugee camps, in the refugee tents, alien to the area, alien to even climate, totally lost with huge depressions. I remember, I remember Les Médecins Sans Frontières, they were working there and they saw women with deep depression, but still they had to work, still they had to look after their children. This was not an easy time. When I saw women being refugees in Pakistan or in Iran, in the refugee camps, 
in my heart, I thought, okay, maybe the ones that they are refugees in sophisticated countries like West, they will be better off. But I saw them alien to environment, to language, to religion, and worried that would they lose their children, would they lose their culture to a totally alien culture? Yes, physically, they were safe physically, they were very comfortable. But they had other worries. They were lost. That's why it is important that we should not, we must not allow women to go through that experience once again. I was one of the Mujahideen. I was the spokesperson for Afghan Mujahideen. I was proud. I was proud that my country, my men, my people are fighting a foreign invader, I will do it again. But there are many things that I will not do it again. I will not push under the carpet human right. I will not push under the carpet women's right. Because it takes a long time to regain it. Or really, would you regain it? I'm not very sure. When the Mujahideen government happened, the civil war started. Again, women were number one victims. They lost their jobs. They lost their positions. They were totally under a government or a situation that they don't know how to deal with it. When their homes were bombed, when their husband's dead body or their brother's dead body came, they had to take care of the rest. How? Because they were not allowed to work properly. They didn't have opportunity to work properly. Just imagine those women. When the Taliban's government happened, people had hope that they will bring peace to Afghanistan. But peace cannot come with having one side of the country and forget the other. Yes, we made a mistake in Bonn. We forgot the Taliban are part of the Afghanistan. But millions of other mistakes happen that these mistakes piled up, and this is what we see in Afghanistan. During the Taliban era, women lost the opportunity to study. As a Muslim, the same as praying, the same as fasting, this is your duty. It was exactly the same that someone will stand in front of a woman and not allow this woman to pray. Because education is important for a Muslim. The first order of God is Iqra, read. Al the right of writing. And if a government become obstacle in front of that, I can't understand it and under the name of Islam. Women couldn't study, women couldn't work, women couldn't have political participation. If a community, whether women or under a linguistic issues or ethnic issues, a woman is not allowed to be an important, a meaningful part of a political process, what a future you can see for that woman or that language or that ethnicity. The last 20 years, in spite of war, in spite of instability, Afghan women flourished. And it was the new constitution, the current constitution. I still call it new. It is not new anymore, but the current constitution. I'm proud that I had a part in it. I was a commissioner in that constitution. We went in consultation to many, many places, the most remotest areas of Afghanistan to consult with people. And I was pleasantly surprised that educated or uneducated, they knew exactly what they want in this constitution. We, the commissioners and people who were uh, involved in this constitution, we had to protect this constitution from two sides, either extremism views 
against women, against uh, freedom of speech, against all that. And on the other hand, there were also pressure that it should be uh, a secular constitution. But we knew that a secular constitution will not work in Afghanistan. People of Afghanistan are deeply Muslims and they want their constitution to be Muslim. And when now I hear that some people criticize from the other side of the negotiation table that this is a constitution made by foreigners, it breaks my heart. When I remember those days, months and months of traveling in an Afghanistan which didn't have roads at that time, we had to go and have body pains and body aches for days because of those very difficult traveling, but consult with the people of Afghanistan and keep this constitution away from foreign eyes and foreign influence. Under this constitution, women in Afghanistan flourished never before, like never before. In numbers, we have hundreds and thousands of highly educated, capable women aware of their politics, aware of their future, that they cannot be and must not be ignored. They work. They work in high positions. They are part of Afghanistan. They are lawmakers. They are ministers. They are ambassadors. They are future makers. So we have to remember that they are a very important part of Afghanistan. Here in Doha, we are lucky. We are lucky that we have at least four women. I wish, I wish that we had more, but I do know that there are peace talks, not in Afghanistan and other countries that didn't have women at all. The result was bad, but it was the reality. I'm happy that at least we have four. But what makes me more happy is that our male colleagues are as determined, as serious about women's issue. The same way that we are as serious and as involved in every aspect of Afghanistan's future, whether it is the future constitution, whether it is the future form of the government, women's future, but also importantly, the future of minorities of Afghanistan. I make sure as a woman, I will never, I will never separate the women of uh, the issues of women and the issues of minority from uh, our talks because they are connected to each other. It is the whole of Afghanistan when I say the whole of Afghanistan, I mean regardless of gender, regardless of um, lang languages, regardless of ethnicity. Like India, Afghanistan is much, much smaller than India. But like India, we have many languages, we have many ethnic, ethnic groups, we have different kind of Islam uh, that they are worshipping, and we have Hindus, we have Sikhs, that they all live in Afghanistan. And it is important that we will produce an Afghanistan that will be a home for us all. And that cannot be achieved by military solution. It can be achieved only and only in spite of military success. It will be achieved by a political solution, negotiation, a proper conversation. Thank you. Excuse me, uh, there's one more thing that came to my mind now, which is new for me. Um, we also have to remember, because this is a question which came from a journalist yesterday to me, and I wanted to talk about it um, today to you, that there are, people ask us that do we believe that Taliban have changed or not? I would like very much to believe their word, but how does their word and their action in the field are parallel? Which one should we believe? Should we believe that yes, their view about women, their view about 
ethnic groups, the view about the future of Afghanistan has changed. And yet we see in the ground that nothing has changed. If it has changed, it has become even more negative. So which one should we believe? And here, it is important for you to know that the, the world, and especially the region, could play a very good role. Everyone knows that the future of Afghanistan will still be dependent. And Afghanistan cannot feed one person without the help from outside. So it is extremely important the conditions are put. The condition of women right, human right, and minorities right. And also, above all, when we choose our leader, it has to be one vote, one person, nothing more. Thank you. Here I will really end. Thank you, Ms. Galani. It was indeed a very inspiring lecture by you. Thank you so much. Now I would request the questions which we have received. You, you should answer them. Number one question we have received is by Tanisha Acharya. She is asking, how has the absence of women representation in the current political negotiations and the lack of women politicians affected the rights of women? Well, um, there isn't any lacking of women. If you see any negotiation in the world, um, very hardly you will see that you will have a big number of uh, uh, women. Most of the time, women are totally absent uh, from the negotiations. We have four women, but now with these uh, new facilities we have, we have been um, consultations um, with all over Afghanistan, with women organization, and also a civil society, that they will bring the questions and the requests of women that what exactly they want. So it is not lacking. I mean, yes, like any other woman, I also wish we had more women in the negotiation table. But as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, these four women, I'm one of them, humbly, uh, we are really, really determined that the voice of the women that they are not present, uh, they should be there. But if you look at that, we don't have the representation from all uh, ethnic groups either. But it doesn't mean that the rights of those ethnic groups are, um, are not taken seriously. Here, four women, we all um, have to, uh, are in one different uh, committee. I'm in the legal committee. And the same way um, Dr. Sarabi is in ceasefire and the same way. So we are involved, but above all, um, we have very, very active uh, women's uh, organizations all over Afghanistan. And uh, the Afghan uh, Women Network has been like a lifeline for us, put us at the picture and always gave us um, the guidance how to go forward with it. Thank you, Ms. Galani. The next question by Tanisha is, the past 20 years, women in Afghanistan flourished regardless of the situations, but now with the Taliban taking over, the basic rights of women are under a severe threat. How do you look at this threat? Do you see a need for the intervention of the United Nations to prevent atrocities against women? Well, I mean, uh, it is the duty of everyone to, to make sure, uh, but above all, it is the duty of Afghan people um, themselves that not allow such a thing to happen again. And uh, for me, it is very difficult to believe that from now on, uh, uh, women could be uh, marginalized. Because uh, <clears throat> if you see the uh, circumstances that the Taliban came in power the last time, is very different from today. At that time, Afghanistan was going through a civil war. I mean, those Mujahideen leaders uh, who fought Soviet Union, 
uh, with the exception of one or two party that they didn't uh, take part in the civil war, they were fighting each other. Today, the same people, some of them are not alive, but their parties are there and their sons are there. They are all united under the umbrella of High Peace Council. They are not fighting each other. We are all united. So it is not like before. So it is the Taliban and the rest of Afghanistan. And the Taliban also, in their words, they do say, I mean, uh, recently in Rome, uh, you saw um, in social media that the huge changes regarding freedom of speech, women's issue, education, women and education, women and political participation. In all this, there were talks. But I want to make sure, when I was a young woman in Afghanistan during uh, King Zahir Shah, that we call it the golden era of Afghanistan, the, especially the time of the dem uh, democracy, I mean, the uh, constitutional monarchy. I remember it very well. Believe me, I would hardly even think about my gender because I knew that in remote areas, women need to be changing the same way that it is in India today. Um, that in villages, life of a woman is totally different from the cities. That was the case. But when we were in the cities, we were equal. So that's how I, I grew up. Today, there are many more women like me, many, many more. It's a huge force. I don't think it will be easy um, to harm them the way they were harmed. I mean, we were harmed during the Taliban. Thank you, Ms. Gilani. I now welcome Dr. Wail Awad, our distinguished advisor, West Asia, to make some comments and questions. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Kamakshi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Khanum Fatima. Nice to see you and listen to Afghanistan and to the place where I have visited before and after the Taliban fall. So I have covered Afghanistan extensively. And uh, Rahmatullah Ali Ahmad Shah Masood, time when I was, uh, that time when he was assassinated. My question is, I have two couple of things to, to ask before I make any comment on this, actually. One is the issues that there have been some rumors that the Taliban is after women in Afghanistan now. They are after the young girls and they're asking them to list them. The young girls and the uh, widowers and all, they wanted for their fighters. Is that a true? because there are lots of rumors in the media in this one. And the second part I wanted to know also from you is how much is the Afghani civilians are suffering now? Wherever the Taliban are getting into any of the provinces, any province they enter, there is a fleeing of people into neighboring countries and they are creating an exodus of civilian and the number of being getting killed are so much. Could you please elaborate on these two points? Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. It is wonderful to have you with us. It's an honor. I know that how much you care for Afghanistan, and uh, it is very important for us to have you today here. Uh, yes, these are the rumors that we hear. And uh, we actually spoke about this uh, with uh, Taliban. Um, uh, not, of course, in the negotiation table, but when we meet, we live in the same hotel when we meet, uh, not officially to talk to them. Of course, they, they deny it, um, and they, they ask us to, to bring evidence. So far, we didn't have a solid evidence here, but in Afghanistan, they have it, and it has been dealt with. This is a very, very difficult issue, and this is the issue which had happened before. And this has to not to, to happen. Sometimes, even before it happens, because of the past experience, there is a huge exodus of families with young women who are just sending their girls outside uh, the cities. I know hundreds and hundreds of families, they have done that. That's what I'm saying. It has disrupted not just the war, the whole of this fear, the whole of this uncertainty has really moved the country in a very bad way. And also, this is one of these fear is one of the causes that in many places people don't fight and they just uh, run away, which is very dangerous. And this is something 
doctor, that we cannot deal, deal with it uh, alone. It has to be dealt with it internationally. And uh, the way that it will put a, make a proper impact. The civilian uh, people, I remember a few days ago, um, on CNN and journalists asked me about uh, the educated women who were working for foreign uh, or NATO troops that they are giving a refuge uh, and they are getting out of the country, how dangerous it is for Afghanistan. Good luck to them. But what, like you, what makes me really, really worried is internal refugees. The number is high. The country is in poverty. And the countries, plus the poverty, it, has, it is going, like in the whole region, it's going through a very bad drought. So you can imagine these internal refugees, they go to a totally unknown uh, situation and what will happen to them? And of course, women will be the first victims. I was the president of the Afghan Red Crescent Society, which is the equal equivalent of your Red Cross, for more than tw uh, 12 years. I saw that in the wars, even in the best of the time in yeah. the last uh, 20 years, how bad it was for civilians. Whether it was the American bombing the areas to find one or two talibs, how the civilians were hurting badly, or if um, a suicide bomber happened in Kabul and the uh, target was like your embassy or the target was wherever it was, but it was the civilians who would be killed. So yes, doctor, always civilians, always civilians are the ones who are hurt. Thank you, Dr. Weil, and thank you, Ms. Gelani. I now welcome Dr. Meena Singh Roy, Head West, Central Asia Center, Telotma Foundation, to make some comments and ask questions. Thank you, Kamakshi, and uh, let me welcome Ms. Fatima uh, to this foundation and the very, very uh, enlightening lecture, let me say. And being a woman, I think you look like a ray of a hope for me. You know, your positive uh, notes in the context when everybody is talking about the negative, uh, you know, things in Afghanistan. So that is what I think is uh, one of the very, very interesting aspect that you uh, just now, you know, alluded to. Uh, you also talked about the changed Taliban today now and uh, how united the Afghanistan uh, is today. Uh, I mean, I only uh, wish that Afghanistan comes out as a united country, you know. Uh, any any uh, problem, you know, any uh, issue within the country, despite being extremely complex, uh, the solution to the problems have to come from within and not outside. Uh, having studied many regional uh, and, you know, uh, national, uh, you know, civil wars and conflicts that we have seen, ultimately the solution has to come from within. And I only hope that happens in case of Afghanistan as well. Uh, and as you said that today, there are many statements which are coming out by the leaders, you know, the, 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 uh, the spokesperson of Taliban. And I only hope uh, that uh, all the commitments and assurances which are being given by them uh, would be practically implemented later. Uh, and uh, having traveled to uh, Afghanistan as a woman, you know, and that too at a time when things were not so good. When we passed through the Iraqi embassy immediately within an hour, I think there was an explosion. And I visited uh, Panjshir and what a beautiful country and a beautiful people uh, that we have, you know. And uh, I wish peace, I wish prosperity, and I do wish, you know, a uh, lot of good luck to the women. But uh, I, what I, what, what my fear is that uh, I hope there are enough forces within Afghanistan, you know, who would be able to convince, you know, the, 
the government which would come to power. I mean, here I'm talking about all the factions and how, you know, this peace uh, deal, uh, as you like to call it, uh, and I hope it turns out to be a peace deal. External uh, actors and, you know, people can only help or facilitate, but ultimately it is people within who have to decide and take a call. And there are some, you know, forces who would very much like in Afghanistan to continue uh, as a country, you know, which where we see the internal conflicts and problems. But I do feel, uh, having interacted with many youth during my stay in that short period, you know, uh, they are fed up with the violence. They are fed up with uh, the situation that they have been in. And uh, within Taliban also, I mean, young people want to, you know, study. Young people want uh, infrastructure development in the country. The women are extremely dynamic uh, and they are highly qualified. Uh, very, very aware women that I have come across as far as my interaction has been concerned. So today I, in this, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the narrative where everybody is saying, you know, uh, it is going to be the return of violence, it's going to be a bad situation that we need to be prepared. Yes, one has to prepare for the worst, but uh, I, uh, I, I mean, as a woman, what are the fears that you think, you know, despite the, the certain positive notes that I have heard from you? Uh, you still feel, you know, that there could be uh, damage to, and particularly to the education sector, that is uh, where my fear is. And I hope that the, you know, education of women would continue and that there won't be, you know, forces within Taliban, you know, with the ideology and many other, you know, who may not agree. Uh, what are the fears? I mean, that uh, I would uh, like you, but otherwise I wish you, a good luck. And I think India has a very special and unique relationship with the people. And uh, that, uh, regardless of what happens there, will continue. And I'm sure as a woman, you know, we support your cause. Uh, we would like to be directly, indirectly involved in that affairs, whether it is in Central Asia or in any as an NGO, you know, one can still contribute uh, quite a lot. And thank you once again. It was such a delight to see you, Amir um, Fatima. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Roy. I mean, it is wonderful to have you. Um, yes, I was called uh, optimist many times. Uh, and uh, several times I was called the, the crazy woman who believed that Soviet Union will get out of Afghanistan. I remember a very important personality that I'm not going to name. Uh, called me that crazy woman who believes that Soviet Union will get out of Afghanistan and say that from which country they have got out so that you believe that they will get out of Afghanistan. I told him that, no, I'm not that crazy woman. I am the woman who knows that Soviet Union will get out of Afghanistan. So it's not that I think that they are getting out of Afghanistan. So today, I have my optimism for one reason, that neither side of the negotiation table said the negotiation is not important. And we are still talking, we are still seeing each other, we are still conversing, one. Two, it has become very clear for all that those that they are going to help us in the future, they will not accept a military solution. It has to be a political solution. So this will give me hope. I hope that they will st stand to that and they will take it seriously. And the talk of the Taliban, whether this recent talk in Rome, or it was in China now, or it was in Tehran, when they were talking that they are not, um, they can't take cities, I mean, they claim, but they will not take it because they also believe in the political solution. Let's take them accountable to that. And in this, true that the people of Afghanistan will have to have a role, but also, um, the foreigners will have to have a very important role. And I think it is very important that the region, the region that we have to live with them, and they are as important as they are for the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, it, they are important for the future 
country, whatever it is named, and Taliban included. So they have to make it very important that it is happening. You ask that either the young Taliban have changed or not. Not much, because very few of them lived in countries like in Qatar or somewhere that their children had opportunity to study. Usually they, are, they live in areas that there isn't any opportunity for their children to be educated. Unlike the Mujahideen, that they have changed tremendously. I mean, the Mujahideen, I, I, I was the spokesperson for Mujahideen. I was part of them. But many of the Mujahideen, they looked exactly like the Taliban are looking today, the way they think, the way they act, and all that. But then all went inside Afghanistan. And as soon as the civil war, especially the last civil war ended, and especially the last 20 years, they had opportunity to uh, to be educated. And most of them are highly educated, and they want to live in peace and prosperity. This is the big um, the difference between the former Mujahideen or the Mujahideen, as we call them, and, and Taliban. And my hope is that we will have an Afghanistan that we will all have to learn how to live in peace and prosperity and send our children to be educated. And the importance of education, which is prescribed in our religion. I mean, this is a shock for me that when we talk and we take the flag of that religion, but we underestimate that the teaching of that religion, that how important education is, for me, it is shocking. I know that there is a huge changes in um, a military field. But my point is that this is exactly what was happening. We wrongly chose not to speak with the communist government at the time, and we opt for a military solution. Look at it. We are fighting for the last 43 years. Why should we want to repeat that again? That's why it is important to take seriously the future of Afghanistan. Doctor, you said something very important about the civil war we had just before the last uh, era of Taliban that those um, politicians, Afghan Mujahideen, that they were fighting each other. Yes, today they have rivalry. It will, I don't want to give it a rosy picture. They have political rivalries. But for us negotiators, what is important, they are all united in the values. They all want one person, one vote, regardless of what language they speak, what political uh, mind they have. They all want women of Afghanistan to be an important part of Afghanistan. Without exception, they all believe that what we have in this current constitution is important for the future of Afghanistan. I wish, I really wish, in this difficult and dangerous time of Afghanistan, that even politically, they will shelf their uh, differences and today they will have even stronger voice. But as far as it, are we are concerned, which is the value of the, uh, uh, the, the values and uh, the importance of the values, they're all united. Whether it is the president of the Afghanistan, whether it is the big umbrella of High Peace Council under Dr. Abdullah, that all these politicians are uh, part of it. Uh, in values, we are all united. And this is very, very important. You say that if um, there isn't a, me with all optimism, uh, if it isn't a political solution, I see a very, very bad situation. I see a civil war and a war that we have never seen for the last 43 years, and we have seen really bad. So this would be worse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Galani. Thank you, Dr. Nina. We have received a question from the audience member. Yes. Kindly enlighten the Chinese approach for building peace process in Afghanistan with hardliners like Taliban, especially in women issue and their rights. What Afghanistan women leadership expects, expects from India and how India can facilitate for strengthening the rights of women. 
we ex what we expect from India is not different to what we expect from all these countries that they are inviting the Taliban, whether it is Iran, whether it is China, Islamabad, or Turkey, or um, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, or whatever. We have to be together in this. The region can play a very important role. What I see sometimes disappoint me. They talk about women's issue, but when they receive Taliban, there are hardly any women seen in the delegation, in the host delegation. And some of these countries, they have highly educated and highly involved women. But when they are not seen in that negotiation, when they talk with Taliban, what do you expect them to believe? Because they cater uh, or they design the negotiation or the talk or receiving um, a country in a way that will be appealing to Taliban. And they don't show them the reality that if it is China, whether it is Iran, whether it is um, uh, any country, uh, when they receive the Taliban, they should show that here are men, but we also have our women. And look at it. So when they come here and we are sitting in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan with four women, maybe that looks strange to them, or maybe they will uh, just say that, oh, they are just a token to be there. So that's why it is important for India and also other countries that uh, when they talk the women's issue, uh, they have to walk the women's issue also. And in those uh, talks, women should be present. Thank you, Ms. Gillan. Thank you so much. We have just received one more question. This is by Mr. Navneet Khan. And he is asking that uh, how well a compromise have been reached between 1964 versus 2004 constitution on the issue of women rights, how flexible Taliban leadership, how flexible Taliban leadership uh, leadership on this issue, does US leaving faster had any less leverage on it? This is something that uh, we have to come to an understanding. Yes, pressure from outside is important. All these um, talks of uh, conditional um, aids for the future and recognition for the future, all this is very important. But it is equally important that we women in Afghanistan, we show that we will not accept anything less than that. This negotiations uh, maybe had lots of um, faults. It went slow. We didn't achieve anything so far, which is tangible for the people of Afghanistan. But don't forget that if you see the situation of women from day one till now, I mean, us sitting with them, uh, it has changed a lot. At the beginning, it was sort of shyness from our side, and we were not um, quite comfortable about the whole situation. And they were not also the same. But today, they, they talk with us, they deal with us exactly the same way that they deal and talk with our male colleagues. And they have accepted that we are part of um, uh, the society of Afghanistan, and, and we are educated, we are well versed. Uh, we have a former lawmaker like the, the Ms. Kofi, we have a former governor like Dr. Sarabi, and I worked with them uh, when I was the president of the Afghan Red Crescent Society, as well as being a good, I hope, a good uh, auxiliary to my government, but I was also kept the neutrality of the nature of Red Cross Red Crescent. So I worked with them in a really uh, way that uh, the Geneva Convention and the, uh, the rules and regulations of Red Cross Red Crescent prescribed. So they know us and they see that we were, uh, we were effective in our work. We were, we were serious in our work and we were taken seriously by the people of Afghanistan. So that by itself changes. That's why mm, I argue that when they are received in countries, 
women should be a part of the, uh, the host uh, country uh, delegation. And flexibility, they showed a huge flexibility in the recent talks uh, in Rome, uh, and uh, which was talking with um, the potential donors of Afghanistan. And also in China, when they spoke about these values, they spoke very well. But I want them to be accountable to that, that today when places they take in Afghanistan, it doesn't look that way. So that's why we have to argue about this, that uh, this situation has to be clear for us. It is an unclear situation and it is worrisome. Thank you, Ms. Gilani. I now request Dr. Weil to make the final comments. Thank you very very much. Thank you, Panam, and thank you, uh, Pintuma Foundation, Kamakshi, everybody. I'm very happy to see and proud, in fact, to see an Afghani woman could stood all these difficulties and speak her heart out and let the world understand what Afghan women who have enjoyed equal with the men of Afghanistan since 1962, and they continue to do so till date, in spite of all the bad news we get from Afghanistan, at least there are hopes that the Afghan woman will continue to contribute to the society as much as the men of Afghanistan. Being in Afghanistan when I was in the, before the fall of Taliban, where all the media and the international community propaganda was against women, atrocities against women. But then I must also recognize from your talks that there are some cultural and there are Islamic values that the women of Afghanistan continue to dignify and to practice which make them unique. It may be look odd for other people outside, but when I sit with uh, Dr. Fatima or I sit down with any Afghani woman, I realize that we have so many things in common to share and we are all humans. We are very happy to have you with us till, until Tumma Foundation. And we are very proud to see that all of the women of, of Afghanistan contribute to the welfare of the people of Afghanistan, in spite of the fact that we may feel hard time coming because of the Taliban, but I think also the Taliban should realize and recognize the importance of women in Afghanistan in contributing to building of the society and rebuilding Afghanistan. I think the people of Afghanistan deserve a peace. They deserve to be back into the normal life and the neighbors and the big powers should understand that the proxy wars fought in Afghanistan should be no more. And people of Afghanistan, like my country in Syria or in Iraq or Libya or Yemen, we should all come back and war should be end and cease and we should see a prosperity, inshallah, in this part of the world. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so office. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Weil. Thank you, Ms. Fatima Galani, for this excellent special lecture on Afghanistan and Afghan peace negotiations, Taliban and the challenges for women. Thanks to Dr. Weil Abad, Distinguished Advisor, West Asia, the Lotama Foundation. And thank you, Dr. Meena Singh Roy, Head West and Central Asia Center, the Lothma Foundation, too, for being part of this amazing lecture. We hope to see you again soon and collaborate with you. I thank the, uh, I th I thank the attendees for coming here and to attending the lecture. Thank you for your precious time. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.